principal at Maynard Consulting. Among other specialities, he is a pioneer in applying Earth resource expertise to assessments of asteroid, lunar and Martian space resources. Larry is editor of Economic Geology and author of SEG 100th Anniversary Volume, World Scorn Deposits. Larry was the head of mineral resources for U United States Geological Survey from 2012 to 2018. And before that, he was a professor of economic geology in Washington State University. And today, Larry is going to be talking to us about earth resource expertise. Larry, all yours. Okay, so you said you were going to do a poll beforehand? You're muted, Nolene. Um, Larry, I've logged in from another device and my polling session is inactive. So while you're talking, I'll see if I can get that up again. <laughs> okay, then we'll just dive into it. I can, I can probably launch polling now. For, I, I can do that as a co-host. Great. If you could do that, please. There are two questions, um, Craig, if we yep. do the first one. Uh, we can do uh, both of them, I think, are going to come up at the same time. So yes. polling is happening now. Yes, so I, I can see them and those are two questions there. The first one is very simple. Space resources, this topic, is it all hype or is there a reality to it? Obviously the topic of my talk. And the second one is a little bit more pointed. If there's any reality, will there be production of some resource beyond Earth within 15 years? I think I should end the polling now. Okay. The, the trends are looking like they're not going to change too much. If you could share that, please, Craig. Uh, um, I thought so you could see it. I can see it on mine. I think I have to end the polling first. Let's, let's, let's show it at the end of the talk and see how we go. Okay. So I think Larry, take it away. Okay, let me see if I can get rid of the poll on mine. Yep, there it's gone. Okay. <clears throat> okay, there we go. So <clears throat> there is an awful lot of hype concerning space resources and there's an awful lot of what could only be called nonsense um, out there. Um, and that kind of takes away and diminishes from the fact that there is a, a reality here. And so in today's talk, I will try to illustrate both some of the nonsense and also explain what is very likely to happen and how it will proceed. Um, this is just a, a headline, one of thousands that I could grab from, from news accounts. Um, you can tell not only from the size of the type, but that trillionaire is a totally uh, capitalized, uh, indicates what they're trying to uh, flog on this particular um, article. It's also pretty common to have things attributed to physicists. Uh, for some reason, the world tends to ascribe physicists as the reservoir of all truth and knowledge. And us poor geologists and geochemists, well, we're just physics, physicists who couldn't quite make it. Um, so if they can get a physicist to make a comment, it's somehow treated as reality. Um, this is a fairly humorous cartoon about what space resource exploration might look like. And I'll give you a second to explore all of the biological niceties of this uh, cartoon. Uh, this is clearly what space resource exploration is not going to be like, um, but it is the public perception at some level on par with the concept of space trillionaires, people making tons of money in space. 
In contrast, this is what space exploration currently looks like and almost certainly will continue to look like for a long time. And that is robotic and remote sensing. Um, the cost of getting a human to space, and I'll describe some of the nomenclature of space in a minute, um, is simply prohibitive. It's just not going to happen as an exploratory stage. Okay? It's not that we can't get humans uh, to different locations, but that it's extremely expensive. And there's just no business model in which it makes sense to send humans to be doing exploration. So this is what exploration looks like. This is one of the rovers that's currently um, on Mars, very heavily instrumented and can produce a lot of really, really valuable information. Okay, and so more sort of truth or fiction, hype versus reality. Um, this is the illustration from the website of one of the companies that has now gone bankrupt. Um, and I won't comment further about that. Um, some of the things they illustrate in this uh, graphic um, are real and, and some of them are complete nonsense. The biggest fault that most people have, and it's similar to what's going on in Earth relative to deep sea mining, is that people extrapolate a little bit of information to huge areas like the entire Pacific Ocean or the entire surface of Mars or the entire surface of the moon. Um, on this illustration, they've got a, a single uh, 500 meter diameter um, asteroid that is platinum rich and they've calculated the value of, of that uh, platinum, $2.9 trillion. Okay, so what's real? Yes, there is platinum in some classes of asteroids. I'll explain that, that terminology in a bit. Um, but that it has no value unless you can somehow process it and do something with it. There is almost no need for platinum in space. And so this cartoon is predicated upon bringing that platinum back to Earth. And as I'll explain in a minute, there is no way that that's going to happen. So this falls completely into the category of nonsense. So here's an artist illustration of a, a space tug. Uh, they've somehow sliced up a asteroid into big blocks. And here's this space tug, presumably bringing it back to, to Earth. And again, they've calculated the value of of, of platinum in um, this uh, resource as if you could get it back to earth. Okay, this will not happen, okay, for all sorts of reasons. There's no way to actually produce these big blocks out there that look like they were sliced by a diamond saw in somebody's uh, core shed. Um, and there aren't too many diamond saws out there in space. So the idea that you could somehow slice something up and then transport it but the biggest reason why this will never happen is that this would happen. Okay, this is actually an art installation in Washington, D.C. at uh, the Hirshhorn Museum um, where somebody has uh, illustrated uh, some sort of space asteroid, bolide, uh, that's come down and squashed somebody's car. Okay, now that's not the, the real issue. The issue is the force of gravity. And I will need to walk through this uh, but first, just a little bit of nomenclature about different places in space, because I'll be referring to these. So this is not drawn to scale. It's just drawn to illustrate various things. So we've got the, the Earth there on the left and a variety of orbits. Uh, and the acronyms LEO is Low Earth Orbit, and that's the one closest to Earth. To have an orbit that close to Earth requires very high speeds to keep something, a satellite, or anything else um, in orbit, uh, it's, so gravity doesn't pull it down. As you go further out, you don't need to be going as fast because gravity is weaker. So the middle Earth orbit, uh, the geosynchronous Earth orbit out there is uh, the distance where you can maintain a satellite or some other body um, at a fixed spot over a spot on Earth. In other words, you're going at the same speed as the rotation of the Earth. And then you can have high Earth orbits that may be elliptical that take you much further away from Earth. All of those things are relatively close to Earth. You can see the, the diameter of the furthest one out there is 36,000 uh, kilometers. And that is very small compared to the distance to our nearest celestial object, the moon, 
which is 400,000 kilometers. So obviously not to scale, but this gives you an idea of the relative placement of these. And so you could have the same terminology for the moon. So LLO is low lunar orbit. And then there are two red dots out there, those Lagrange points, which are equidistant gravitationally from the moon and the earth. So you have one that's in between the moon and the earth and one that's on the far side of the moon. And at that point, you can park an object uh, without having to spend energy to keep it there. Okay. So it can be stationary because it's gravitationally equidistant between those two bodies. And then if you talk about the nearest planet, Mars, that's 400 million kilometers. So an order of magnitude further than the moon. And these things are important because a lot of people, when they talk about things in space, uh, treat the distances as being all roughly equal, okay? And they're not, okay? There's huge differences between these various uh, orbits around uh, the Earth, the distance to the moon, and to Mars. And we won't even mention <laughs> other galaxies. Okay, so this is the mother of all understanding of space resources, okay? It's, it's Familiarly referred to as the rocket equation. And basically what it tells you is the amount of energy necessary to go from point A to point B. And any sort of movement in space, whether it's coming from Earth or the Moon or the Mars, requires energy. And that's because there are gravitational fields out there. And so to move any sort of mass, uh, either with or against gravity, requires energy. The best way to think about this, it's like the amount of gasoline necessary to go from one city to another on Earth, whether it's by a car, train, or an airplane, it requires fuel, i.e. energy, to do that. However, to go into space, particularly to escape from Earth's gravity, requires a huge amount of energy. Okay, so something most people don't realize is if you launch a rocket, any sort of rocket, even to the lowest stable orbit up there, low low Earth orbit, LEO, 80% um, of the mass of that rocket is fuel. Okay, so if you want to take a liter of water, a liter of platinum from Earth to low Earth orbit to escape Earth's gravity, okay, you require this huge amount of fuel, i.e. energy, to get there. So this is just a graphic to illustrate some of those things. So this is all expressed in terms of delta V, so the amount of energy. Okay, and this is the, the, the language of, of space travel. So you can see going from the Earth's surface up to, to LEO requires a huge amount of energy, 9.3 kilometers per second. To go from there to a higher orbit requires much less energy. And going all the way to the moon um, requires some more energy, but the biggest chunk of energy is by far just escaping Earth's gravity. This is why the concept of having propellant um, somewhere in space, you can think of it as a space gas station, and propellant usually is liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen, uh, which is very easy to uh, accomplish. Um, if you can have sources of those, whether it be at LEO, on the moon, Lagrange point, or somewhere else, that greatly reduces the cost and increases the, the technical feasibility of any sort of travel in space. And that's why later on I'll be describing how and where we might be able to produce propellant. And this is going to be a chicken and egg type feature. Until we have sources of propellant in space, it's going to be extremely expensive to do anything in space from Earth. Again, because 80% of the mass of a rocket is just fuel to escape Earth's gravity. So if you can launch a rocket up to one of these orbits and then refuel it, you've now totally changed the economics of what's going on. So here's the bottom line. It's the water. Water is the first, the main, the only resource that is going to be developed um, within a matter of, of generations. Okay. So the idea of going anywhere to get platinum or any other metal, uh, either using it or bringing it back to Earth, simply not going to happen. Okay, water is going to be the first thing developed and until somebody is developing water, um, all the rest is just some future theoretical possibility. And that's why I'll spend a lot of time talking about water, where we can get it, and uh, what you might do with it. 
So we know there's water um, throughout uh, the inner solar system. We have water on the moon, we have water in asteroids, we have water in Mars, all in different forms. And I'll describe a little bit about that. Okay, but the current focus is on finding water and then producing things from it. Okay, it's very simple to break water down to hydrogen and oxygen, okay, which is useful not only as propellant, but obviously for respiration and a lot of the other things that would be involved with any sort of space exploration. Uh, starting with the moon, because it's the closest object by far of everything we'll talk about, uh, the water that we know about um, occurs in, in two places. And the, the one where we have the most information is in what's called the permanently shadowed craters. Okay, and so this is water that never um, receives sunlight because it's permanently shattered, shadowed in the craters. And we know it's there both from remote sensing and one of the experiments that was done, which actually sent an impactor into the crater um, to basically blow debris up into, I was gonna say into the air, <laughs> obviously it's not air, uh, in, uh, away from the surface so that they could analyze it uh, spectroscopically. And so we have very clear evidence for the presence uh, of water. We don't know much about uh, its distribution, its purity. These are all things that would need to be determined. But the fact that there's water there is pretty clear. So people have thought, well, if there's water there, how would we do something useful with it? So this is one of the concepts that's been floated, and that is the idea of having reflectors up on top of the, the crater that can intersect the sun's rays and then beam that energy down to the permanently shadowed crater floor. Okay, the technology of doing these sort of reflectors is uh, fairly standard. We actually have things of that scale um, in orbit around the Earth right now. It's all on the classified side, so I can't really talk about it, but trust me, there are things the size of football fields up there um, that can reflect large amounts of sunlight. Okay, so what do you do with that sunlight? Okay, well, down on the crater floor, you build some sort of, of tent. This doesn't have to be a, a very strong physical structure, probably some sort of mylar um, dome. You are focusing that sunlight with the mirrors down to it. It's warming it up. The water is sublimating uh, from the surface and the subsurface. And then once it's sublimated into um, the, the, the atmosphere or away from the surface, it's very easy to pull it into a, a cold trap because you have basically an infant supply of cold um, in the, this region. And a cold trap, anybody's ever done isotopic analyses, you know how efficient cold traps are for sucking everything out of a gas stream. And so again, this basic technology is fairly well known. Doing it at scale and doing it in a different environment, that is what has yet to be demonstrated. Okay, some simple economics. Okay. The current cost of getting a liter of water from the earth um, to, to space, whether it be to, to Leo or to the moon, um, it is quite large, about $30,000 a liter. Okay, obviously you can go to the store and buy water for a whole lot less than that. And so these are some models that have been done to um, <clears throat> look at the relative cost and economic advantage of water and producing propellant, and again, Breaking water into hydrogen and oxygen is relatively simple, um, just using solar energy and solar energy within the cislunar space. Okay, cislunar just refers to area between the, the Earth and the Moon. Um, <clears throat> solar energy is basically infinite. So you have an unlimited, continuous, 24 7 supply of energy. So breaking water down to hydrogen and oxygen is relatively straightforward. Okay, so on Earth, the cost of water is pretty darn cheap. We just made up a, a, a matter of uh, pennies for the water. And then <clears throat> producing that in different places. So if you go out to the moon on, on the far right, you can see that the, the cost of producing it there, um, although non-trivial, is much, much less than bringing it from Earth. So the big blue bar is the cost, roughly $30,000 uh, per liter. Um, bringing water to the moon from the earth and relative to the cost of producing it there. 
And then as we move to different places, Lagrange points or the various orbits around Earth, you can see the economics uh, change. But even for LEO, it's slightly cheaper to bring it from the moon all the way back, not to Earth, but to low Earth orbit um, than it is to bring it from the surface. Okay, they're, they're roughly equal, but that's uh, a real revelation for most people. The idea that you could produce water on the moon, bringing it to LEO cheaper than you could bring water from the surface. And again, it's because of gravity. The cost of escaping Earth's gravity is very, very large. And whether it's water or a human being, um, it just takes a huge amount of energy and therefore money to do it. Okay. Now, we know we can do it. You know, we have sent many, many people um, to low Earth orbit, to various orbits. The International Space Station has been manned for, for, for decades. And we've obviously sent people to the moon. So we have the technology to do it. So what remains to be done is to actually produce water, i.e. propellant, um, somewhere in, in space. So doing it on the moon is one possibility. Okay, another possibility are <coughs> on asteroids. There's basically three types of asteroids referred to as M, C, and S. The M's are mainly metallic. They represent the cores of bodies um, that were large enough to differentiate and early enough in the accretionary process that they were able to melt. Okay? And the main heating is the radioactive um, isotope aluminum 26, uh, which decays very quickly. So there's none currently um, around, but that is what caused most of the initial planets and asteroids to melt. And so they had to be of a large enough size to, to melt and differentiate. And then subsequent uh, impacts from other meteorites or other asteroids uh, would break them apart and expose the metallic core. So it's these metallic asteroids that people in those cartoons talk about the amount of platinum. Okay, and we know from se uh, simple KDs, distribution coefficients between silicate magmas and, and metals, um, that there will be significant concentrations of platinum group elements in these. Okay. And we have physical evidence for that in terms of meteorites. Okay. We have thousands of meteorites that have been collected on Earth. We can correlate them with the various asteroids out there through spectral properties. So we have a pretty good idea of what's out there and what its characteristics are. The C group are the chondritic or carbonaceous asteroids, and they have significant amounts of both water and carbon in them. And then the S types are basically the rocky, um, what used to be the crust of asteroids that were differentiated. So you have the metallic core and the rocky crust. Okay, it's the C type that are of interest relative to water. Okay, and there's lots of them out there. So here's a very simple graphic showing the orbits of the inner planets and the main asteroid belt. You can see that there's lots of them out there. Okay, estimates for things greater than 100 meters, 30 million. So there's no shortage of them. And there's all sorts of distributions relative to gravitational fields like Jupiter. You can see the Trojans and the Greeks. These are basically following in the gravitational shadow of Jupiter. Uh, the hill that's on the other side are due to the relative absence of gravity of Jupiter on that side. But the fact that there are millions of asteroids out there is not terribly relevant. What we really need to know is what is close to Earth. So again, we look at the energy necessary to get to a particular asteroid. And then unlike the moon, which is relatively stationary compared to Earth, um, we can go to the moon anytime uh, that we wish and have the resources. Whereas for any body that is orbiting the sun, like another planet or the asteroids, you actually have to look at where they are within the orbital uh, rotation. Um, otherwise, you'll spend all your energy traveling much, much further away. So you have what we call a launch window or when it's possible to get to them when they're reasonably close. And usually the uh, threshold that's used is less than three kilometers per second in terms of energy to get to one of these bodies. Okay. That being said, there are still thousands of potential C-type um, asteroids, in other words, having water um, we have various estimates from remote sensing and from samples that have come to Earth that you have water contents ranging from a couple percent to a couple tens uh, percent 
uh, of water in, in the form of ice, uh, they're, they're all frozen. And if you have enough water um, and it's moving, then we call it a comet. And that's what the tail of the comet is. It's the vaporization of the water. Okay, so what would you do with it? Okay, it's actually pretty similar to what's been proposed for the moon. And this is a particular company called Transactra uh, that is developing this, this technology. And the idea is pretty simple. You have some sort of big inflatable bag, the mylar type bag, so it's not a, a hard shell. So this could be transported in a, a rocket of some sort and then expanded. And again, we have this technology already. We are using it um, in various orbital configurations around the Earth. Again, it's all on the, the classified side for big things, but trust me, they're up there. Okay, so you enclose your perspective asteroid with this. You have solar reflectors, again, intersecting the sun's energy, beaming it into the surface and basically causing spallation uh, of the surface and the liberation of, of water into the tent. You have cold traps on the side, uh, here illustrated up on the top, where you can capture that water. And then once that's full, you could either process it there or move it um, to another point, like the Lagrange point for the moon or to uh, low Earth orbit around the Earth. Again, transporting the propellant that produced water um, in space from one point to another, it's not zero energy, but it's much, much less than escaping Earth's gravity. So the technology of doing this obviously is, is very rudimentary and has to be developed at scale. But uh, this company is actually working on it. They have a test bed at the Colorado School of Mines, which has the only graduate program um, in space resources. And I do some of the introductory lectures there with the students. Um, they actually have a laboratory where they're doing the, the optical mining of synthetic um, asteroids to demonstrate the technology. And it's pretty impressive when they crank that thing up, <laughs> the amount of, of energy uh, that's coming from uh, the equivalent of, of solar energy and watching the rock just disintegrate before your eyes. Okay, so let's talk about what's possible and what's not. Okay, it, it's been 50 years, a little bit more than 50 years since humans were on the moon. And that's pretty startling when you think about it. So we had the technology 50 years ago to get people there. And if you think about the changes in technology, uh, aviation, uh, communication, the internet, uh, the computing power, um, all these things have changed so much. So we obviously could get there 50 years ago. We could do it much more easily and much cheaper now if we desired to do it. Not that it would be cheap, don't get me wrong. It's still requiring large amounts of money. But what else has also changed is the emergence of private industry. And I'll walk through that um, in a bit. Okay. Some things have changed in the wrong direction. Um, this was a NASA project uh, called the Resource Prospector, um, which would be basically a, a rover of sorts to go to the moon and actually start doing some of the sampling that's going to be necessary to do any sort of resource extraction. When I'm talking to my friends in the space community, I really have to go back to basics. And for the present audience, you know, you'll just smile. But when I explain to them the, the concept of a resource feasibility study, they have no idea what I'm talking about. You know, the idea that you would start mining something without having proven a resource or a reserve uh, would just be laughable for anybody in the mineral resources industry. You're not going to spend huge amounts of money um, for something you haven't proven is there. No bank is going to lend you money. And yet in space, uh, for the people who aren't used to earth resources, uh, they just treat it as what's there and you just go pick it up and what's the problem? What could go wrong? So anybody in our business knows all the things that could go wrong. So having some sort of physical sampling is a prerequisite. Um, this resource prospector was canceled. It's now been resurrected with a scheduled uh, launch in 2023 and it's been renamed uh, VIPER. I'm sure it's an acronym that stands for something. And so the, the concept that we need to do some, some sampling of the most likely targets for resource extraction um, is, is not totally gone away. 
Okay, why are we not going forward? Okay. And then we have all sorts of wonderful political things. The person who occupies the White House, I prefer not to use his name, um, has proposed going to the moon by 2024. And that's about as realistic as many of his other proposals. And I won't get into the politics of that. But what it means is that politicians like to say and promise things, particularly when it's beyond <laughs> their term in office. So that somebody else has to pay for it and do it. Okay. But it just illustrates that it's still on people's mind, the idea of going someplace, uh, why you're going there and what you might do. Eh, haven't thought about that too much. And as we get different presidents in office, the aspirations change. So for some presidents, we want to go to Mars. For others, it's going to the moon. And what will happen with governments? Uh, we all have governments we have to deal with. And who knows what will actually happen with them. This is an artist's conception of what it might look like if you were to start developing things on the moon. And again, there's both hype and reality. Um, one, this big physical thing, the cost of transporting any of that from Earth is prohibitive. You're gonna to have to develop resources in space and that's gonna be robotic. And so the actual technology, and there's several companies who are working this right now, is developing the robotic capability. Um, one of the things they have at the Colorado School of Mines is an at-scale 3D printer that's big enough to be able to print buildings. Okay, and when we use the word print, what we're actually talking about is taking the granular regolith, um, mixing it with what you might call cement, um, and using it to actually fabricate a building. Okay, all that can be done robotically and that will be a necessary precursor. Okay, so ignoring the, the artist, artistic uh, freedom of the diagram, um, some of the things are real. You'll notice that there's this strange looking sheath around uh, the building, big blocks or something, and that's for radiation shielding. Okay, and that's gonna be necessary anywhere in space. Um, it's something NASA has looked at <clears throat> quite in detail, even for the journey, whether it be uh, to the moon or certainly to Mars, which is gonna take more than a year uh, to get there. Um, we know that the, the radiation exposure um, is a real problem for, for human health. So any sort of, of habitation um, is going to require significant radiation shielding. And so that's another thing besides production of propellant will be the fabrication of stuff to shield you from radiation. What is really changing the picture is private industry. Okay, and there's been various steps. Probably the biggest one conceptually uh, occurred in 2017, the end of 2017, when SpaceX, which is the, the company spearheaded by Elon Musk, is one of those visionaries who just makes things happen that other people can't even conceive of. Um, he's developed the various you know, Falcon rockets um, that are capable of doing pretty significant payloads. And to demonstrate that, he launched his own personal bright red Tesla into space. Okay, and it's currently uh, making its way through the, the solar system. Okay, this is actually an image of it. They mounted a camera on, on the thing. And so they got the little uh, dummy, it's not a person there. Okay, now there's no practical need for a Tesla in space. I wish he would have launched it to my garage so that I could have it to drive around. But he did it to demonstrate the capability of putting something with significant mass um, into space with the rockets they've developed. And if you follow these things, the, one of the big breakthroughs with that rocket is that it's reusable. They can actually bring the main stages back to earth and land them. And this one really blew me away when I first saw it, <laughs> land them on a floating platform in the ocean. So the technology has changed dramatically from the 50 years ago when we first went to the moon. Okay. <clears throat> Another big step occurred in 2019 uh, when the Japanese uh, sent Hayabusa 2, uh, this is one of their remote satellites, to an asteroid, to Raigu, landed on Raigu and took a sample of it and are bringing that sample back to Earth. Now, I know you're thinking, 
but Larry, you just told us you can't bring things back to Earth. Okay, we're talking about micrograms. So they're just demonstrating the ability to do it. But the idea of navigation to a body with basically no gravitational field and being able to, to land and to take a sample, again, this is a very, very small sample, and bringing it back is a very impressive uh, demonstration of technology. Okay, here's another big one. Uh, April of last year, China announced plans for a moon base within 10 years. Now, whether or not this happened, I don't know. But if anybody could make it happen, it's the Chinese. The ability to marshal resources, to have a sustained strategic vision, uh, and the US, no strategic vision is gonna go past four years in the electoral cycle. China obviously is a different model. And so when they say that they plan to do this, um, I think it, it requires much more serious uh, consideration than if it was just some politician in the rest of the world. Okay, so what exactly their plans are, I don't have any particular knowledge, but it certainly got a lot of people's attention when they announced that. Okay. Some other announcements. In June of last year, NASA announced tourist visits to ISS, the International Space Station, for $35,000 a night. Now, this gets really interesting. Okay, now, relative to a hotel, $35,000 a night, that's a lot of money. But there's a lot of people who can afford to spend $35,000 a night. And to be able to go and spend a night on the space station, okay, I might even spend $35,000 to be able to do it. Now, the fine print is that you have to get yourself there. It doesn't include transportation. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> it is another step. And as, as I will demonstrate, private industry is developing the capability of moving rockets, which are capable of taking people to this sort of low earth orbit, um, would enable this sort of operation. So I think there's a significant market out there. They've already got thousands of people who've made a down posit uh, to do this. And another step occurred in October last year uh, when Virgin Galactic, okay, so this is Richard Branson's uh, brainchild, um, got listed on the York Stock Exchange. Okay, so their business model is quite simple. They're going to take people up to space. Okay, this is low Earth orbit again, um, probably for a couple of circles around Earth and bring them back down um, for a price somewhere in the range of $100,000, $200,000. Okay, now, that's, again, a lot of money, but there's a fair number of people who spend much more than that uh, for various junkets uh, around the world. Uh, I've never actually thought about these things, but I've, I've seen catalogs for around the world, first class travel for six months in your own private plane. Okay, <laughs> and they are the same price that uh, Richard is talking about taking people uh, to space. So you combine that with staying at the International Space Station and you suddenly can see a possible business model. Okay, not for mass transportation. This is not going to uh, be anywhere close to what we see with airline travel around the world, but it's the, the first glimmering of things happening. And the reason why this is important is that there's a tipping point here where having propellant in space suddenly becomes not only necessary for the actual development of space, but that there's a business model there. And there are currently companies that have uh, offered contracts for the delivery of propellant to different spots, Lagrange spots or the low earth orbit, um, for on the order of two to $3,000 um, um, per kilogram for propellant. So eventually uh, this is going to happen, okay? And almost certainly will be either entirely private industry or a joint venture, so to speak, between governments and private industry. The model for this right now is NASA is contracting uh, with SpaceX to take supplies to their National Space Station. Okay, so NASA, I was gonna say, it doesn't have the capability of doing it by themselves. That's not quite true. They could if they spend enough money. It's just that SpaceX can and is doing it cheaper. And so NASA says, okay, well, then we'll just allow that. So it's a small step from relying upon companies like SpaceX to transport supplies to the International Space Station 
to transporting people to the National Space Station to building a fuel depot um, that would then allow you to go other places much, much cheaper. Okay, another big development. Okay, the SpaceX, you probably read about this, it's been within the last couple of weeks, um, was able to actually take people, we call them astronauts, um, up to the space station. So this is now private industry taking people to the, the space station, okay, not as tourists. Um, this is just demonstrating the capability for future NASA contracts. And they introduced the concept of fashion. These are the actual spacesuits um, that they have developed. And there's clearly a designer element to this. Not only are they functional, but they look uh, pretty sexy. And they look much different than the ones 50 years ago, uh, where people look like they were, were robots inside the, the spacesuits. So this is another uh, big change in, in technology. And you can see the, the timeliness of this because the people in the back have masks on. So clearly we are within uh, coronavirus uh, timeframe. And it raises the interesting question of, oh my God, what happens if <laughs> these astronauts <laughs> have coronavirus and go up to the International Space Station and oops, <laughs> contaminate somebody who's already up there? Uh, I don't even want to think about the details of that. Okay, so here's when they did it. On May 30th, uh, they, they launched the, the Falcon rocket with the astronauts on board. They successfully got them up to the space station uh, with the uh, Falcon module, all developed by SpaceX, all developed with private funds, private engineering, okay, demonstrating that we have the capability of doing this. And so these are people going up, they're up there right now at the International Space Station, and then they will bring them back down all by private industry. And if you follow these things, uh, Elon Musk has made all sorts of pronouncements about what they uh, are going to do or would like to do. Uh, at least half of them strike me as the, the nonsense category, but I would never count out a visionary like Elon Musk. I mean, anybody who had the, the gumption to launch his Tesla into space, you know, he says that he's going to have colonies on, on Mars within some time frame. I don't think that's going to happen, but the next step almost certainly will be the development, probably robotically, of production of resources, water, and propellant um, on the moon, and again, transporting it to what we call gas stations in the sky. So that is the quick tour through what's possible and what's not. To quickly summarize, it's water. And the business case is pretty simple. If you can produce water and break it down into hydrogen and oxygen as propellant, you then have lowered the cost of doing anything in space by orders of magnitude. We have private companies who are already doing it from Earth with the huge energy penalty of escaping Earth's gravity. So the tipping point will be when this actually occurs. So if we go back to our poll, that's the question. You know, how likely is it that something will happen in a certain time frame? Okay, it's not gonna happen within a year. The question on the poll was, will it happen within 15 years? Don't know, but I'd say there's a reasonable chance given how quickly things are proceeding that we will have both tourist travel to low earth orbit, i.e. to the space station, or to other places and the development of propellant within 15 years. I've already got a bottle, a bet of a bottle of wine on this with a, a colleague who thinks I'm nuts. So we'll see who gets to pay for that bottle of wine. We'll drink it together no matter what happens. So thank you for your attention and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much for a very well illustrated talk. Um, and uh, pardon me, but maybe a little bit more down to earth than we've been hearing about from some of the space exploration companies. Um, question and answers, uh, questions and comments. Uh, I'll open the floor to that now. Craig, there's a, a question on the chat from Stéphane Stuplessy, who wants to ask about helium in soil on the moon as a jet propellant. Um, so, there's helium-3 on the moon, and that has a very high value uh, because there's, there's much less of it on Earth, and it has <clears throat> uses on Earth. Um, I really don't know about um, the properties for propellant. Uh, it's not a combustible gas, so if anything, you're using it as a thrust 
And so it's not clear to me why you would use helium, but I really don't know any details about that. I don't have any particular involvement with helium. Any other questions or comments? I, I see I'm not sure we're seeing the that, same. Yeah, that carry my, on. My, my former colleague, Gordon Cole, uh, is on the uh, group. So I just wanted to say hello to Gordon out there. I haven't seen him for several decades. And it looks like he may just have dropped off, but hopefully he heard my hello. Hello, Craig. Yes. Uh, this is Tina Scooter speaking. I've Hi, got a Tina. question for Larry. It doesn't have direct bearing on your presentation, but you said earlier that aluminum 26 um, did exist once on Earth or on the planets and it uh, was used or it was, it induced heating uh, and melting of the larger planets. So how, how did people realize that aluminum 26 uh, exists or exists elsewhere if it doesn't exist on Earth? Okay, so let me clarify this. Um, if you get into cosmochemistry, um, how um, stars and planets form, okay, and I'm greatly simplifying this, okay, when you have a, a supernova that um, is a star exploding. Um, it spreads uh, material that's generated from that explosion through a large volume of space that then can coalesce into um, various gas clouds, into more stars, into more planets. So aluminum-26 is one of many um, isotopes that are generated during that supernova process. And so that'd be time zero. So if we think about our solar system, okay, at one point it was simply a gas cloud, again, the remnants of previous supernovas. And so you would have a lot of elements that are only generated um, during that sort of supernova explosion. Okay, all the heavy elements and, and, and various isotopes. And it's not that they're not present somewhere else, it's just they have a relatively short lifetime, which is why they generate a lot of heat. So within, and I don't, remember what the half-life of aluminum 26 is. Uh, I think it's like a million years. So within uh, 100 million years, it's basically back down to zero. Okay? So it's not that it didn't exist, but um, it is decaying rapidly enough that there's none left okay, after a certain amount of time. So during that first, let's just say 100 million years, um, you had enough aluminum-26 and other isotopes as well, um, but that is a fairly abundant one, um, generate enough heat that as you coalesce enough dust from the original gas cloud to a body, whether we call it an asteroid or a planet, and that's just a size distinction, once you get to a certain critical mass, no pun intended, um, you will cause melting. Okay? So during the early history of the solar system, we did coalesce the gas into the sun in the, the middle of it, and then the various planets at different distances. And they have different compositions because of that radial distance uh, from the sun. Um, but the aluminum-26 um, was present everywhere. So when I say it's not present on Earth, it's just not present anywhere because of decay. So if you go back to the first million years of our solar system, then certainly what became Earth would have had aluminum-26, which is why we have a metallic core and a molten uh, core around that from the initial heat. We have a question from the chat box. Um, uh, Mataji, you've got your hand up. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Oh, yeah, hi. Um, thanks. Uh, I've got a question for Larry. Yes, um, so I was just wondering, are there any like environmental risks that um, we should be concerned about with doing uh, space resource exploration? Because I know with, um, you know, with uh, some of the nodule exploration in the sea, 
that has not really been, there hasn't really been much progress because of uh, some of the, you know, pollution that's associated with that. So I was just wondering about, you know, uh, the exploration in space. Um, yes, it's a perfectly valid uh, question. There's at least three different components to it. Uh, one for the moon is that there's concern about disturbing what we call artifacts of the previous lunar missions. So where humans first walked on the moon in those footprints, that archaeological value, it's sort of like on Earth, where we have you know, evidence of, of humans 50,000, 100,000 years ago. And that's really important because once they're destroyed, so we don't want to suddenly have somebody land at the same spot as humans did 50 years ago because the, the, the rocket um, thrust would totally blow away all the, the footprints. That's just one example of archeological value um, on the moon and you know, who owns that? Who uh, would police that? And this is another big thing for space. We obviously don't have space law yet. Um, we could argue that we don't have marine law. I mean, there's some steps in that direction. And we could even argue about on various continents within various countries, you know, how developed law is. Okay, and anybody who's been involved in uh, exploration for resources certainly pays big attention to the political stability and legal status and reliability of you know, resource law. So th these things are, are quite important. Um, using the old real estate phrase of location, 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 um, Lagrange points between Earth and Moon. Okay, that's a, a particular point. So if I go up there and put a fuel depot there. Can you put one 100 meters away from me? And mm -hmm. what about the risk of that? And we, we simply don't have the legal structure. And so those are all important questions. Relative to environmental things, um, and this gets fairly philosophical in a hurry. Um, one, what standing do we give to other bodies? Standing is a legal term in terms of um, nobody owns the moon, nobody owns Mars. So who uh, either legislates or regulates or speaks up for the integrity of that, if we want to call it ecosystem. Okay, a more practical issue is if you were going back and forth between either the moon, Mars and Earth, the possibility of contamination going both directions. In the early space program, it was mainly concerned about um, bringing some sort of pathogen from, say, the moon to Earth and wiping out the human species. People figured that eh, probably wouldn't be a good thing to do. So in the early stages, the amount of um, quarantining and sterilization of things to avoid any possibility of that. Um, there's also concern about going the other direction of taking Earth materials, you know, whether it's biologic or a chemical contamination, to other bodies, to the moon or Mars. And this has really come into play with um, the search for life on Mars. Um, they have found various things like, uh, uh, I'm blanking on the name, but I was gonna say chlorites, that's not the right word. Um, anyway, uh, basically it's the rocket propellant, the oxidizer. And they've not been able to rule out the things that they have found on Mars that could be metabolites from biological activity, but could also simply be perchlorites, yes, um, from the various rockets and uh, landers that have gone to Mars. So that's a contamination of Mars, not so much in terms of uh, you know, causing disease, but interfering with science because so maybe we brought it with us. And if they were to sense, say, a, a biological activity, whether it be a metabolic product or actual you know, remnants of a biologic material, how do we distinguish what might have come with our rocket ship or our landers? So again, it's complicated in a hurry. If we try to make the analogy to marine resources, which I think is a good 
um, semantic step in the thought process, um, the phrase out of sight, out of mind uh, comes to mind. So if we you know, don't see it, we don't walk around on the bottom of the seafloor, we tend to be less concerned about it and to know less about it. Okay, so that is an order of magnitude or more of an issue when you go to, to other bodies. So we simply don't know. Nobody has thought about that. If we look at the history of resource um, utilization on Earth, almost certainly the resource utilization will occur first, and then some sort of legal structure will evolve to deal with problems as they arose. In an ideal world, you'd figure it all out first before you did things that might make a mess. But we simply don't have the capability of anticipating all the possible problems. So that's a long way of saying we don't know. Well, thank you for your very um, in-depth answer. Uh, B. Wren has, has a hand up. Hi, uh, yes, uh, my name is Ren. I'm a geologist tuning in from the east coast of Canada. Hello, thank you for your presentation. I had uh, a question on um, about the limiting factor. So you focused on the limiting factor of having a or finding a propellant in space, but can you speak to some of the solutions for bringing some of those resources back, um, unless uh, the intention was that the propellant would be um, trying to find resources in space for use in space only? Um, that appears to be the only practical um, utilization, okay? And so it's called ISRU, in situ resource utilization. Again, the cost of bringing something back to Earth, it's not quite as bad as bringing it from Earth to space, but you still have to overcome gravity, okay? Right. And not burn up um, in the atmosphere. And so um, even very high value commodities like platinum, there's just no way that you're going to be able to bring it back from wherever in space to Earth at a cost less than the highest cost mine on Earth. And so the business case just is not there. If you can produce it on Earth for a fraction of the cost of bringing it from space, why would you ever bring it from space? So the only things that conceivably could be brought back to Earth are one, really high value commodities that probably are created or manufactured in space that don't exist on Earth. Okay, and some examples have been floated out there. And uh, I wrote a, a paper on this in the SEG newsletter about a year ago and it explained some of this. So one of them is growing optically continuous uh, crystals in space. So the current bandwidth restriction on all of our fiber optics communications is the actual, um, uh, what's it so frictional loss, the, the, the loss of, of light as it travels through a crystal. And we know that if you can go down the C-axis of a, a quartz crystal, um, that the, the loss uh, of energy is less than if you're going uh, perpendicular to the C-axis. Okay. So this, in terms of glasses on Earth, doesn't really make a, a big difference. We're at the limiting factor right now. However, it is possible if you can get into to space where you don't have gravity, you could grow a single continuous quartz crystal of, of infinite length, and it would have a transmission capability uh, several times higher than what we could do on Earth. And the mass of such a fiber optic um, thread uh, would be quite low. So there you have the possibility of creating something that has capability that you could not do on Earth. And its um, mass in terms of transport is, is relatively small. Uh, another example people have talked about and somebody alluded to earlier is helium-3 on the moon, uh, simply because the, the resources on Earth are quite limited. They buy products of uh, petroleum and natural gas uh, production. And I don't know all the uses of helium-3, I think it's in reactors or something or other. Um, and so, but people have talked about the fact that we can get helium-3 on the moon. And the reason it's on the moon is because of solar bombardment uh, creating helium-3. Um, how you would actually produce it and transport it is a, a separate issue. Um, but again, it's something that doesn't um, exist on Earth. And so what are the unique properties in space? Well, 
we basically have very low gravity and we have no atmosphere. We have very cold temperatures. So things that either would not be possible or would cost a lot of money, say to maintain a, a cold room, you know, at close to absolute zero, um, you could do, um, you know, for free or at much lower cost in space. And so that raises the question of manufacturing something that would then be economic to come back to earth. But in general, the idea of going up there and grabbing a boulder and coming back to earth is simply not gonna happen because the business case is just not realistic. And right. all that's due to gravity of Earth. So again, a long answer to a short question. No, I don't see anything coming from space to Earth. Um, and if it does, it's going to be a real niche market. So the 800-pound gorilla is going to be water, and it's using it in space. And number two will be bulk materials for manufacturing, buildings, radiation shielding. And the bulk of that will be done um, robotically. So the development of the robotic capability of doing that is something that several companies are really focusing on. If you wanna see an example of it, if you uh, look up off-world mining, it's a company that specializes in robotics and they're basically training their systems in earth mines where robotic capability is, is useful, either due to high heat or radioactivity, other things that having people there, it's not such a great idea. Um, and their focus is in developing the technology so that it can be used once there's a call for it, and obviously a business model in space. Right, thank you, thank you very much. Thanks for that. That answers uh, one, one of the questions in the, in, the, in the chat room. There's a second one concerning how mine waste will be addressed um, in space. Uh, has there been any thinking, thinking done about that at this stage? No, but I refer to my previous answer, you know, out of sight, out of mind. Um, <laughs> just like, you know, mining on the seafloor. Well, what's the problem with waste? You just kind of dump it over there. Nobody can see it. So you're on the moon and assuming you are separating, let's say you're, you're mining water. And so the stuff that's not water, we call waste, is going to be, what, returned to the bottom of the crater. Um, does anybody care. We're probably not going to go back to a, a crater once it's mined. There's probably not going to be tourists going to the crater. But these are things that, one, we haven't really thought about. Two, will be a subsequent stage, in my opinion, after the, the resource development, just like human history on Earth. Um, there's sort of a need or desire to, to do things, and then that will expose um, various potential problems such as waste and what should we be doing with it. Um, so the short answer is no, people haven't really thought about in detail beyond just the general arm waving. Yeah, we'll do something with it. Okay, thank you very much. With that, I, th I think we'll close the, the session. Um, I'd like to thank you very much for presenting this and uh, we'd like to note the, our sponsors for the month of June is Dennis Blewett in the Geo Explore uh, store, who's uh, kindly put up some money to allow us to have these lectures. Milene, would you like to say anything to close out? Um, I'd just like to say thanks, Larry. That was fascinating. Um, and at times, laugh out loud. My dog ran away. I was laughing so much. Um, and we're looking forward to your next talk about scones. Everybody else, thanks for joining us. And we'll be back tomorrow, Friday. I'm going to end the meeting now. <laughs>